Thank you very much, Simon. And uh, may I add my welcome to everybody? My name is Chris Davis, and I serve as the chairman of the Open Group IT for IT Forum. Um, I've been involved in this initiative for about four years now, and it's my pleasure to introduce one of our more senior subject matter experts, Rob Akershoek from Logicalis in the Netherlands, to speak to us about one of the four value streams that provide an overview of the IT for IT reference architecture. Since it was launched or published, I should say, in October this year, the standard's been downloaded well over 3,000 times by over 500 individuals in over 500 companies. So we're delighted that you join us today for this deeper dive into the third of the four value streams, request to fulfill. So I will hand over now to Rob, who's been working in this space and is passionate about it, spoke at uh, the Open Group Conference in Edinburgh in October, and we'll give more on IT for IT at the Open Group event in San Francisco. Um, but over to uh, Rob, and then I'll rejoin you at the end of his presentation to help field the questions. Thank you, Chris, for this introduction. And welcome all to this presentation about the Request to Fulfillment Value Stream. Before we dive into this value stream, I will provide a short introduction to the IT for IT standard. The IT organization provides IT services to the business to support and automate business processes. IT is shown here as an integral part of business operations. But until recently, the automation of the IT function itself has been neglected, as well as managing IT from a business perspective. Instead, IT has implemented different fragmented processes, tools, and teams, unable to cope with this new IT reality. But IT leaders starting to realize that the IT function, similar to the business, has its own value chain and requires its own information systems that need a carefully worked out architecture and blueprint. And that is what IT for IT standard provides. This diagram shows the IT value chain as part of the IT for IT reference architecture. It describes the operating model for the business of IT and is characterized by taking a more holistic approach to IT management. It provides the bigger picture of how IT is delivering value to the business. Using a value chain approach, IT for IT offers a blueprint for managing IT services across the entire service lifecycle. And the value chain approach provides a model that is immediately familiar to executives responsible for the business of IT and shows how the architectural components are all interrelated. The IT for IT standard enables the IT function to deliver services in a better, faster, cheaper way with less risk. There are four value streams defined which provide direct value to the business. These are strategy to portfolio, the plan, requirement to deploy, the build, the request to fulfill, and the deliver, and then detect to correct, run. But there are also five supporting activities, being the governance, risk, and compliance, sourcing and vendor management, reporting, finance, and resource management. All these activities are enabled and orchestrated by the IT for IT reference architecture. It's important to know that it's not just a linear model, but it's actually a dynamic closed loop of continuous feedback and improvements. Now, the core concept of the IT for IT standard is the IT service model. And the service model describes the service as it moves through the value chain from conceptual to logical, and then finally to a deployed service or the realized service model. This also represents the dynamic and continuous feedback loops. In the planning stage, the service model is conceptual in nature. Think of it as a marketing plan of the service or product of IT. But it defines what business needs does it address, but also who are the customers and what value does it bring them, and how much will it cost, and when do we provide it. And all these services are managed in a portfolio. And the portfolio looks at the service from a value and benefits perspective, as well as what investments are needed to develop and maintain this service over time. It becomes a logical service as it moves along the value chain when it's created, whether it's built or sourced externally. And the logical service model describes the service from a development and integration perspective, such as the requirements, the system design, the source codes, the build, the deployment elements. Consider this as your service blueprint. And then this logical model can be released, published, 
as a service to users or deploy directly into an operating environment. Which brings us to the realized service model. And this realized service model represents an instantiation of a service to which users can subscribe. And once it's operational, it's continuously monitored to detect potential issues and resolve these before the business is affected. And then finally, it can be ordered through a catalog subscription process. The service model is basically the DNA of our IT organization. It links all value streams and activities together. And everything we do in the IT organization is related to a service model, whether it's a project, a development activity, a request, an incident or a change, a contract and cost, all is related to the service model. And this enables transparency and traceability. Now this slide shows the level one IT for IT reference architecture. The focus of the architecture is on the functional components and the data model. As these are more stable over time and independent upon specific process or development practices, methods and processes will change over time. But the underlying data about the service lifecycle remains consistent. And in that sense, the IT for IT reference architecture is agnostic to process models such as ITIL and COVID. The blue boxes are the functional components. Think about functional components as being the building blocks that you need to support and automate the different activities within your IT function. And the black circles are the data objects. And the IT for IT reference architecture focuses on all the information you need to manage the IT function which is becoming more important to improve transparency and traceability, as we stated before. And then the solid lines are the relationship between the data objects. And then the purple circle are the special types of data objects that form the service model backbone, as shown in the previous slide. Now, if you hide all the functional components, you will see the end-to-end -end nature of the data and their relationships. This is known as the system of record fabric of the architecture. It's basically the nerve system or the DNA of our IT organization. And think about how difficult it can be today to tie information together from different parts of the IT organization, from different vendors, different teams and tools. It's a huge effort nowadays to find relevant information and a lot of productivity is lost due to outdated or missing information. Now, this architecture allows us to tie all that data together and enabling IT workers to find information they need to take decisions. It also allows us to have a better level of automation of active activities throughout the value chain, reduce costs, reduce manual errors, and also create more predictable results. And as we source more services from an increasing number of external service providers, this information model and the ability to share information between these vendors has become vital. And having this common service model is an essential ingredient for successful collaboration and communication with vendors as well as with the business. Now let us review the four value streams to put the request to fulfill value stream into the overall context. First, we have the strategy to portfolio value stream, which is focused on the planning side, understanding your business needs, managing the portfolio of services and defining the roadmaps. It defines the strategic themes and required investments. Here we design analyze, rationalize, and modify the portfolio of services and trigger new initiatives. Then the requirement to deploy is focusing on building and sourcing, turning the investment decisions into actual services. This covers the development and configuration and maintenance of services. It supports both waterfall as well as agile and lean development practices, as well as SaaS application or configuration of standard services. And it covers the continuous cycle of planning the work, designing and developing the solution, and sourcing the solution as services, testing the application, and then finally release the service into an operating environment using the request to fulfill value stream. This request to fulfill is basically focusing at the delivering, deploying, making all services available to consumers through a catalog. Now this is the focus of our session today. And then finally we have to detect to correct, which is focusing on keeping services running in production acting upon events or incidents, but also proactively prevent outages or adjust capacity when needed. Request to fulfill is probably the least mature area in the IT function today. Now to understand the scope and coverage of this value stream, let us look at some of the examples of the different types of fulfillment workflows that we are talking about. There are enormous amount of requests and changes processed by the IT organization every day. And this volume is only increasing as well as the number of parties involved 
in the fulfillment of these requests, such as the cloud vendors. This value stream covers all those requests, fulfillments, deployments, provisioning activities, and changes, ranging from an end user requesting access to a business application or ordering a new laptop or performing password resets, or a developer requiring a temporary test environment or a project member requiring additional servers or databases, but also to deploy an entire application stack into a cloud environment or installation of patches and fixes or removal of unused software or eliminate overcapacity. All those items are part of the request to fulfill workflow. Here are some of the key challenges that the IT organization is facing related to this specific value stream. As we end up with more vendors delivering more services, more products in our catalog with more more changes to them, and more frequent changes and releases that we need to process, for example, due to continuous delivery, but at the same time, we need to deliver faster with fewer errors, provide more flexibility in cost models, but also improve the control on consumption and reduce overcapacity. And the IT function will need to transform itself to become a broker of services and orchestrate a fulfillment across internal and external service providers. The key phases of requests to fulfill are shown in this diagram. First, we have Divine and Publish, which focuses on the creation of a catalog and defining the various service terms and laying the groundwork for the consumption of IT services. And then we have Subscribe, which enables users to request services, manages them, and their associated subscriptions throughout the life cycle. And then we have Fulfillment, delivering the request. This may include orchestration across multiple fulfillment routes, fulfillment engines, and providers. And finally, we have Measure, which provide the information to the consumer or the owner of the service, helping them to manage their subscription and control the spending. Now let's drill down a bit further into these spaces and discuss the activities that take place in each one of them. In Define and Publish, we basically combine all the catalog items and products into multiple catalogs, merging them to a unified view in one single catalog. And once we have those lists of services and requests, we can define available options like pricing and service levels as needed. But we also can publish the catalog in, in the form of offers, enabling them to be consumed by end users. And in the subscribe phase, we can enable users to engage the catalog, subscribe to these services, and manage their subscriptions. We provide a consistent and personalized experience across all the engagements. We allow easy access to information and self-service capabilities to empower users to help themselves. The subscription is a key concept that I need to explain a bit more. Through subscriptions, we maintain what services a user is subscribed to, defining the access rights to IT resources and so on. It can also be temporary with an agreed end date. It improves the control we have over who has access to what resources and why. You can also challenge them whether they still need the service or whether it's still allowed according to policies such as segregation of duties and whether it still fits in their user pro profile or job description. Having this subscription information is at the core to improve the communication with the business. For example, we can now notify the user in case of major incidents affecting that service or inform the user of planned changes and releases of their service. In the fulfillment phase, we process all the user requests and perform the necessary actions in order to make them a reality. This includes routing them to the right fulfillment engines and orchestrating the required activities. Fulfillment is then further complicated due to the many different teams and technologies and vendors involved in the delivery and the potential dependencies between them in order to fulfill certain requests. We aspire to automate as much of the work as possible to improve both the time to value and the consistency, reducing manual errors. Throughout the fulfillment, we consistently interact with configuration and change management system in order to keep them up to date, as well as adhere to corporate policies and processes. And then in measure, the goal is to create transparency and drive better alignment between the service consumption and the actual need. To do so, we measure actual usage of services, giving a more accurate picture of use service utilization. We expose the cost of services consumed in the form of chargebacks and showbacks, and we collect surveys and ratings that are used to improve the quality of the service, as well as to allow the community to provide feedback. 
And all these data points enable users and the business and IT to make better decisions and allow IT to make more wisely choice for future providers, but also augment or change the offering as needed. To understand how a user-centric uh, uh, consumer influence world is changing fulfillment, let's look at the four phases again and see what is changing from a current to the target state, moving from bureaucratic to a service broker, using automation as a self-service model. Today in the define and publish, we traditionally see that we don't have a consolidated catalog and that a lot of requests are managed through mail. So it's basically a manual process where services are built to order. However, we're now moving to a world that is much more automation is needed and services are configured when ordered. So instead of engineering or architects to be involved in every request, we move to a more cookie cutter model. And then subscribe. Requests are moving from sending a mail to someone we know to a unified app store experience where the view is personalized, showing you the service that you're allowed to see and allowed to order. We create a single portal and a consolidated catalog for people to request new services. And then in the fulfill, fulfillment is often known as the most complex and bureaucratic workflow in IT. Deployments require a lot of manual activities, often coordinated through mail, delivery is not transparent, traceable, and takes a lot of time. Instead, an automated workflow is needed where you manage by exception and orchestrate across multiple vendors, as well as to automate the updates to the CMDB and subscription administrations. So everything that is ordered is automatically linked to the correct service, the correct user, the business, and so on. And then measure. The largest change in measurement is moving from blanket charge into a charging for what the user is actually consuming, a pay-per-use model. Instead of fixed costs, move to more variable and influential costs. So the actual usage and consumption is monitored and shown to the consumer to influence the behavior and eliminate overcapacity. The consumer becomes in control of IT spending. Here is the view of the overall IT for IT reference architecture again. Now let's drill a bit further into the architecture of the request to fulfillment value stream. By examining and understanding these key elements of this value stream, you become much better equipped to address the ongoing needs of the business, optimize cost and shaping patterns of consumption, while reducing cost and creating consistency in the services you deliver. The catalog composition components manages the service catalog entries, including all the services that we source from external vendors, such as the cloud vendors. This functional component is the authoritative source for all the items that we have in our catalog. This catalog is integrated with catalogs from the external vendors. And the offer management component is responsible for aggregating all these catalog items from the different catalogs. And offer management is responsible to publish these in the form of offers. And then once published, the offer consumption component basically provides the frameworks for users to interact with the catalog order the services, view or update their requests, as well as manage their subscriptions. The offer consumption component provides all the information that the users need for ordering, but also the necessary information to be captured at time of ordering to guarantee the fulfillment. It also provides information about the current subscription that the user has, with the ability to change or cancel at subscription to reduce cost. It allows consumers also to order multiple offers in one transaction and enables consumers to order on behalf of other customers. When the shopping cart is submitted, the request personalization component processes the request, figures out what is needed in order to fulfill them, and generates the necessary fulfillment requests that are handled by the fulfillment execution component. Request personalization is also responsible for managing the life cycle of all the subscriptions, which is again dependent on the fulfillment request. The fulfillment engine basically orchestrates the actual fulfillment of the request and maintains the correct data like updating the CMDB or updating subscription administration. The usage component then monitors the actual usage of services and its components. And this information is used to identify opportunities like reallocation of resources such as to reduce overcapacity 
but also provide the necessary data for billing and charging. And this charging and showback function basically provides a traceability of the costs associated with services, as well as the insight into the utilization of services that help users or application owners better control their spending. For example, an end user can be challenged or asked to cancel subscription if they don't use the service for a longer time. Or a development team is asked to reduce the number of resources in a test environment. Or an application owner can optimize the resources allocated to their service. So summarizing, the request to fulfill is a continuous cycle of maintaining the catalog, updating the catalog, supporting the request of services, and modifying the subscription over time, but also change continuously the deployed service, like modifying the capacity, and finally canceling the subscription or, move, or removing your IT resources. This diagram is the slide in, in, in what, what we call the level two reference architecture of the request fulfillment value stream. In this diagra diagram, we go into more detail with respect to the cardinality of the relationships as well as the different types of interactions or integrations between the different functional components. It is important to mention the gray boxes that you can see here on the screen. The functional components that are gray uh, are, for example, components that are part of another value stream but have a key dependency with other value streams. And we also have a number of supportive functions. And these are the functional components that cross multiple value streams, uh, sometimes even all four. And they're not necessarily part of a specific value stream. For example, the IT financial management functional component. In this level two diagram, we also see how the request to fulfill tightly interacts with both requirement to deploy and the detect to correct value stream. And this interaction with the requirement to deploy focusing uh, on the receiving information about the service in order to create an updated service catalog, in addition to execute the various deployments that may be used in the process of developing the service, such as deploying the application to a test and a production environment. And then the interaction with the detect to correct mainly focusing on making sure that everything we deploy or instantiate are, is in full sync with the operational aspects, such as activate monitoring, update the configuration database, and adhere to change processes. A key function that is shown in this diagram is the engagement experience portal, which is basically the IT service portal. And this component is a crucial part of the request to fulfill architecture. It provides the one-stop shop for engaging a, 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 with the business and, and IT. This portal provides a unified experience for people to request new services, view existing services, manage their subscriptions, consume knowledge, report incidents, and provide collaboration with IT. And to realize this portal interacts basically with the different functional components across different value streams. The idea is to have a single portal which optimizes the communication of the business and IT. So this portal is not just for requesting services, but also, for example, to view the actual status of a service, or report incidents, search the knowledge base, view plans releases, and perform customer surveys, and so on. There are a number of reasons why you should use the request to fulfill value stream approach as defined by the IT4IT standards. I will mention a few. Using the IT4IT reference architecture for this value stream, we can implement the service broker rule, for example providing the ability to source services from multiple vendors. And we have more and more vendors where we, search, where we source services from, like the cloud vendors. But also reduce fulfillment cost by automating fulfillment activities. We also can deliver faster by automating these activities. And reduce errors and incidents caused by deployment activities. We can improve the control over who has access to which service or resource. And also improve the traceability and auditability by understanding who has approved this request until when it's needed. And then we can also reduce the costs of operations and services because we can reduce the consumption by better monitoring and providing showback, eliminating unused resources, and continuously adapt the, the number of resources you need to run your service. In order to better quantify and track the benefits of the request to fulfill approach, here are a few key performance indicators that should be tracked. And I'll mention a few. First, we have quality, reducing the number of incidents or issues caused by deployments and changes and provisioning activities. 
Then we have speed, which is measured by calculating the average time it takes to fulfill requests. We can reduce costs by monitoring the cost of deploying uh, acti deployment activities or release automation processes by looking at the man hour spent versus the percentage of deployments done in an automated fashion. We can look at the utilization of resources. We can improve utilization by measurement of, of the actual utilization and usage of services. And finally, we have customer satisfaction that we survey and service ratings are collected in order to continuously improve how services are provided. So this concludes the presentation of the Request of Fulfillment Value Stream. You can find more information about the it 4 ST standard at the Open Group website, where you can download the standard and other related materials. I also recommend you to look at the it for it Pocket Guide, which can be ordered at the website of Van Haren. Uh, so Chris, um, this is the end of my presentation. I'll hand over back to you. Thank you very much, Rob. A very, very insightful presentation with much rich information from a, a learned practitioner. And um, we have two questions, both from Olivier Gerard. And what I would like to do is to read them out and then initially respond to them and then bring you back into the conversation, Rob, because they require response from a practitioner perspective as well as a more, if you will, academic one. Olivier asks, what is the added value of IT for IT with regard to TOGAF? And then why create a new standard? Why not just update TOGAF framework with new elements? Olivier, this is specifically about the business of IT. There is insufficient prescription in TOGAF. The crop circle analogy is designed to be modified. So in Edinburgh, we listened to a very insightful presentation from the folks at British Aerospace. TOGAF is just that, with the emphasis on the F, it's a framework. What IT for IT offers is a bespoke prescriptive reference architecture that provides much more recipe card-like off-the-shelf guidance to practitioners like Rob who spend their time working day-to-day -day in this space. So although as good citizens of the open group, We've been using TOGAF to drive the overall endeavor of the IT for IT forum. The IT for IT reference architecture addresses a much more specific space, um, which TOGAF is alone, is not capable of accommodating. Rob, would you like to add any yes. more to that? Yes, maybe it's good to, if you look at how an IT organization is currently implementing, let's say, best practices, you see that TOGAF mainly covers your enterprise architectural processes, and then you use ITIL for service management and maybe Scrum or, or PMBOK for your project and development methods. So what it it does is basically not replacing these, but blend them all together, because you need TOGAF, which basically defines a number of best practices as well. You use ITIL, you use Scrum, you use PMBOK for project management. And so what it it adds to that is how can you make the bigger picture, because TOGAF doesn't cover operations, it doesn't cover project management. So it it basically provides the umbrella to, to blend them all together and really look at the end-to-end -end what you need for your, for your organization. But then it goes further because once you want to implement TOGAF, ITIL, and Scrum, you need the tools and you need decisions at every time in a tool. Now, what the it it open standard provides is the ability to select and implement components that can integrate. So basically it helps you define how you should implement TOGAF, how you should implement ITIL supported by real automated tools and integrations and providing the real end-to-end -end view. Absolutely. Thank you, Rob. And Olivier has, has jumped online and, and, and thanked us for that explanation and also asks that um, request to fulfill or request fulfillment is an ITIL um, concept, if you will, which is part of the service operation guide. Um, and I think in your feedback there, you've, you've explained how the IT for IT reference architecture doesn't compete with, but rather complements. It's actually very different in form from the more narrative textual guidance that frameworks like ITIL and COBIT offer. This reference architecture is standardized, prescriptive, 
and offers the guidance to practitioners like Rob to enable them to orchestrate this increasingly diverse set of service offerings in the space where request to fulfill is taking place. So I think we've addressed most of Olivier's questions there. Can I add to that, Chris? By all means, sir. Yeah, so request to fulfill is much more than the request and managed fulfillment process in ITIL. So what you can see is request to fulfill is looking at the entire life cycle. So it looks at the request side and maintaining the catalog. So that covers service catalog management. It covers, it covers indeed request fulfillment, but also identity and access management, but also deployment automation, so deployment and release management. It includes monitoring the consumption and capacity. So in that sense, it's not an individual process from ITIL. It's actually a combination of processes linked together to do the request to fulfill and continuously look at the capacity, adjust capacity. So it covers, in that sense, if you map it to ITIL, it maps to a number of ITIL processes, being catalog, service, catalog management, service level management, request fulfillment, deployment and release management, access management. So it, 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 and then bringing it into the ability to automate and, and implement it in, in your organization. So you still use ITIL in that sense for these practices for, for a large part, yeah. Absolutely, and I think that the, if you will, the, the liaison, as Olivier refers to it, or the integration, as you've just mentioned, Rob, is actually clearer if you zoom back out to this higher level view of the overall architecture, which we offer in the value chain with its composite four value streams. So that prompts a question from your Dutch colleague, Carol van Zeeland, who asks, which of the value streams do you think, Rob, adds most value? Strategy to portfolio or request to fulfill? and a supplement, which order should we strive to implement solutions in each of these, and how important is integration between the two? Yeah, it's, it's a difficult question to answer, but you could say that it basically the, if you have strategy to portfolio well-defined, it probably saves you the much more, right? Because there you rationalize application service that you don't need anymore. So in that sense, it's an enabler to reduce a cost across the entire value chain. So consider your value chain. If earlier on, you, you, you don't or eliminate projects or services, it will you save cost along the line. So in that sense, the, having strategy to portfolio well-defined saves you most of the money in the sense of eliminating services, don't invest in services that did not add value. So that, and that has benefit in, across the, all the value chains uh, streams after that. Now, where you should start with is dependent probably on how mature you are in each of these areas. So if you have already a good portfolio management environment in place, then maybe it's a good start to, to do request to fulfill. Because a lot of organizations don't have this capability in place. So let's say if you start with probably the most recurring uh, request, like uh, having access to a business application, or install or configure new software on the laptop or, or order a new servers and databases. So you probably is a good place to start there because it's repetitive in nature. There are a lot of requests you, you perform. So if you implement that, you probably will save a lot of cost in, in, in relation to those recurring activities. Absolutely. Thank you, Rob. Bruce, Ran Bruce Rankin asks, are there materials available for advice on how to actually do some of the things that Rob has spoken about and actually implement IT for IT? Bruce, the answer to that is yes. In addition to the materials that you see presented on the screen in front of you at the moment, we have a series of what we call quick cards, which will provide the highest level guidance. If you are a member of the forum or if you have the commercial license to access the collateral in the forum, there's also a Sparks repository there. So this is a, a, a substantial and rapidly growing uh, body of collateral that you can download from the Open Group collaboration portal. Um, so that's the answer to that. Oki Okoli asks, Rob, can we give an example of IT for IT from an application perspective? Uh, I assume then the application will deliver to the business, right? So uh, I, I would if, guess, yes. Yeah, so if you think about IT for IT as a whole and application, so it, there's a lot of discussion whether an application is a service, but consider your portfolio of applications you have that will fit in the strategy to portfolio value stream. 
So you main, basically you maintain your portfolio of all the applications you have and where you want to invest in them. Then yeah. re request to uh, basically requirement to deploy will manage all the requirements and changes and maintenance of that application. And then the request to fulfill will actually deploy that application into a, a test and a production environment and then handle all the requests like a user wants access to the business application or, uh, or the, the operations team want to add new server capacity or, or changes to the environment of that application. And then in the detect to correct, we basically monitor the application, handle the logs, monitor events, take action on anything related to that. And also have self-help and self-search for the end users. You know, so, so the application in that sense, similar to the service you can see is, is across the entire life cycle. And indeed, request to fulfill is not just about infrastructure or it's also about deploying your application, making sure that end users can access it by using access requests that you, people want access to the application, maintaining the capacity and all the resources the application needs and update those, and, and managing all the environments like a development and test environment, basically across the entire life cycle. Absolutely. Um, it's actually quite an awkward question in a sense, and the awkwardness comes from, if you will, the, the, the ambiguity of the idea of application. So the IT for IT reference architecture is strongly service oriented. And the notion of application, like the notion of product or service or tool and so on, is not always consistently interpreted, but there is a huge degree of conceptual cohesion in the reference architecture, which is what gives it its strength and power as a prescriptive standard to address all of the phases of life, if you will, of any application in the IT service management space. Walter Mellink, um, asks, do major suppliers like IBM, Microsoft, and Hewlett Packard provide or intend to provide IT products dedicated to support specific functional components identified in IT for IT? Walter, yes indeed, sir. All three are active members and participants of the IT for IT forum at the Open Group, and you will see representatives of all three of those vendors together with ServiceNow and we hope CA, BMC and other major players in this space on the vendor panel, which I will chair at the Open Group meeting in San Francisco towards the end of January. So there is huge vendor endorsement of this new international standard. So I hope that answers your question, sir. I don't see further questions popping into the screen. So at this point, I'll hand back to Simon uh, thank you everyone for joining us uh, on today's webinar. And this is the last webinar uh, from the Open Group in 2015, but we already have three uh, new webinars uh, scheduled for January 2016. So please do keep an eye on the Open Group website for uh, information about that. So once again, thank you all.